everybody. Welcome back to Circle Time. We have a very, very exciting guest today that I am super excited about and I think you're all going to love. Would you like to introduce yourself? I like yeah. for my guests to Absolutely. take the reins on the introduction. Sure. Uh, my name is Tara Schuster and I'm the author of two books. One is called, can I curse? Can I not yes. curse? Okay. Lots of cursing in these titles. Go for it, yeah. One is called Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies, yes. which came out a few years ago. And then my next book, which came out like a week ago, is called Glow in the Fucking Dark. And so basically, I was a uh, executive at Comedy Central for a long time, where I oversaw shows like Key and Peele, mm -hmm. the David Spade show, just a bunch of stuff. And then took a hard left turn yeah. <laughs> and became an author. Amazing. Yeah. I am so excited to have you on. I have been reading the newest book and I've just been loving it. I'm like sitting at home with a highlighter, like just reading uh -huh. everything and <laughs> loving it so much. So I'm really excited. We love talking about books and stuff here on Circle Time. And I feel like I was saying this last week also, we haven't done a lot of nonfiction. Mm. And so I feel like we're kind of getting into that more and it's just so exciting. And so I would love for you to tell us about the current book yeah. or the newer book yeah. and kind of both of them and how they yeah. go together and absolutely all of that. So I was an executive at Comedy Central for like almost a third of my life. Okay. I was so identified with that job that people would introduce me, Tara Schuster, Comedy Central, like it was my married last name. Okay. Like my job was my life. Yeah. And then at the beginning of the pandemic, I got like immediately laid off. Like, oh, wow. Bye. Okay. Uh, very unceremoniously. And this job, oh. yes, it was not fun. I mean, sorry, not I'm fun. already Please, interrupting go you. For it. But like how... Was that like a breakup? Did it feel like more, more than it like more? Worse? Because so I had grown up in a neglectful, psychologically abusive household, which is basically what all my first book about is like healing from that experience. Okay. What I didn't realize I was doing was subbing in this job at Comedy Central yeah. as my status, as my self-worth, because, okay. you know, growing up neglected in this household where none of my friends... Like, nobody talked about all the things in their house dying. Like, right. all the plants, all the pets. Like, I was alone a majority of the time. Like, no one else was telling that kind of story. Yes. So I've always felt like a weirdo. Mm -hmm. So when I got this job at Comedy Central, I was like, I'm not a weirdo. I'm so glamorous and cool. Yeah. Like, I have so much status. <laughs> Woohoo. Yeah. So I hadn't really noticed that I was using the job as a magic trick. Okay. To be like, look over here. Emmys, glamour, blah, blah, blah. Yeah don't look over here at 25 years of complex trauma. Right. And so when I lost the job, I really felt like I lost a part of me. Totally. And so rather than sit down with my feelings and figure out my life, yeah. I was just like, okay, you got to keep on hustling because or I don't like when I was graduating college, every single commencement speech was follow your passions. Your job right. is your life. <laughs> yeah. You know, which I never right. fully bought into, but like it was the creed of hustle. Was yeah. What I had like. For sure. Drunk the Kool-Aid so hard on. Yeah. So without the job, I was like, I need meaning now. I need to achieve now. Right. So it was 2020. Okay. The biggest thing going on was the election. Right. Little, little known, little election. <laughs> yeah. And so. Nothing crazy. No big deal. Yeah. No big deal at all. Right. I just Googled. How can I help in the election? Okay. First search result, you can register voters in Arizona. Just like that, I'm like, grab my Vitamix, put it in my Prius. Stop. And take off for Arizona. You I, moved just, yes. to Arizona. It, it was like a 48-hour period of decision making. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, because I couldn't stand not having a schedule, not being defined by something. Okay. Not, not being a part, not doing, not producing. Yeah. And so on the highway going to Arizona, I had a full body dissociative episode, one of the worst I've ever had, which wow. if you haven't had one, it's basically your your brain's way of dealing with trauma. Yeah. It was kind of surging up because I didn't have the job to distract me anymore. Right. And so, you know, I was driving down the highway. I'm going 95 miles an hour, which if you know me, I'm not a good enough driver to go <laughs> that fast. Yeah. That was a bad I don't idea. Think anyone is. No, honestly. Truly bad. Yeah, that's a scary yeah. speed um, for sure. Meanwhile, like, I, you know, my hands are on the steering wheel and I can see them. Like I can see my manicure. Right. I know they're my hands, right? but they're like completely disconnected from my body, right. floating above the steering wheel. It was 
super so scary. unsafe. Yeah. I was really, really scared for my safety. Right. And so for the first time ever, I realized I need to pull over. Yeah. I, I can't keep going at the speed of right. my life. I it is it's dangerous. Yeah. This is I don't feel good. It feels like sandpaper on the soul. So yeah. I pulled over and I looked up at the, at the sky and we live in LA where there's like, you literally can never see the stars. No, <laughs> no, but uh, you're like, that's a star. And then someone's like, no, that's a satellite. Yeah. <laughs> that's a Southwest I'm like, flight. I just saw a shooting star. Yeah. Like, that's a plane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So in the Arizona desert, it, oh, it's so clear. I, I was like, oh my God. I'm like, no, in a it's star field. It's the most amazing thing ever. Oh, yeah. To see. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You're like, it's, oh, this is nature. Totally. This is beauty. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And so I looked up at the stars in this like dead of night, because in the desert, there's not much light pollution. Right. And I just asked myself, okay, these stars are glowing in this bleak, bleak ass night. Can I glow? Is there anything about me that can light the way that is good within me, even within dark circumstances? Yeah. Because it was like the top of the pandemic. Yeah. Things were pretty dark. Right. And the whole reason I even questioned that was because we are made of stars. Like this isn't some like cute thing I'm writing on a mug. Right. You know, like <laughs> literally the carbon right. in your muscles, the iron in your blood comes from stars. Yeah. So if I already have that, like, I think I'm so bad and I'm so damaged and I can't trust myself and all these things. And I'm here out on this road. Right. If I could just trust that I actually am made of stardust, like yeah. the most miraculous thing on the planet, yeah. how might I lead my life differently? And so that was the whole question was basically, what is that essential self? Can I let that essential self glow? I really need help. Can I help myself? Yeah. And that's sort of what started the journey of, of this book. Of this second book. Of the second book, yeah. Okay, wow. So you wrote the first book when, and you were kind of unpacking your childhood. Yeah. And everything that came yeah. along with it. The first book was really about how do you build stability in your life if okay. you never had parents. Okay. How do you, the term that I was using at the time, which just wasn't a thing, it was like 10 years ago, was uh, how do you reparent yourself? Okay. How can I nurture, take care of myself, yeah. learn good habits for my own self-care? Mm -hmm. And self-care here is a very specific term. It's like, I'm not talking about sheet masks. I'm not talking about right. a trip to Hawaii, which yeah. is amazing. Like, I'll go with you to Hawaii. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm in. But, you know, real self-care is taking an honest accounting of your emotional life and then totally. giving yourself the nurturing you need. Yeah. So that book is all about what rituals, how can you honor yourself? How can you bring yourself to stability? Okay. Because I was in a slingshot of emotions. I was the girl like crying on your stoop. Or like yeah. if you've been on the subway in Manhattan and there's just this like woman plumped over like yeah. weeping, yeah. <laughs> that was me okay. <laughs> one time a week okay. easily. Got it. So how could I go from that yes. just misery, self, like I had a diss track in my head of like, you're ugly. No one cares about you. No one will ever care about you. You're never going to su succeed in life. You can never be an artist. It's too late. I was 25. Wow. You know, it was young. it was miserable. I was yeah. so young yeah. and I was so miserable. Yeah. And so Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies is all how do you come from that kind of deficit of nurturing mm -hmm. to actually finding any spark of joy in your life. Yeah. And then this book is once you've done that, once you've right. found stability, how do you deepen? Yeah. When you're thinking about it in like a broad way, it's like obviously that first getting through that first kind of that first book was probably like the point blank stuff that you needed to yes. work on. Yes. Whereas this stuff is was the more like underneath the surface, the more the deeper yes. diving, the process in between writing those two. Yeah. Like how how was it different and like what made this one harder or easier than the other and how do you differentiate those two? Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about both. So a lot of writers come up to me and they say, well, I want to write about my worst experiences, but it sounds terrible to sit down and have to like live in that moment. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I'm like, well, then good luck. Right. <laughs> like, I don't how know. else would you, Are you gonna write, write this? Right. Yeah. yeah. So for both of them, the challenge was just oh man, these were the worst moments of my life. Yeah. I'm going to have to sit here and not only write it, but then edit it like five times yeah. and then read the audiobook about it and then talk right. about it, <laughs> right, you right. know? So, yeah. but what's interesting is that the more I've done that, like I, I feel like people always say like, is it therapeutic to write your life story? And I would say, no, doing mm -hmm. it 
fucking sucked. There yeah. was nothing therapeutic about that. Yeah. But having other people share the story and say back to me, oh, I can relate. Yeah. I went through something similar. Totally. Then it becomes, it's much more universal and it's not so much mine anymore. Yeah. So that has been incredibly healing. Right. But I would say that the biggest difference between the two is that this book, I didn't know I had a soul in the first book. Okay. Like I didn't trust myself. And I hear yeah. this a lot. Like, there's so many people who feel like they messed themselves up so badly that they yeah. can't find their true self anymore. They can't make decisions or they got messed up so early in their life that there never was a true self. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, now I know that's not true. Right. It's just not the case. We all have an essential self. It is possible to get back to your essential self. It just takes work. Yeah. So Lily's, I didn't even know. It was basically like fixing all the symptoms of trauma. Right. And then this book, Glow, is more about okay, let's return to your essential self and let's have your essential self glow. Yeah. You know? So one of my absolute favorite parts of the day, every day, it's been this way since I was a kid, it's getting dressed and picking out my outfit of the day because I really just always loved like expressing myself and who I am through my clothes. And I've been using Newly, and I love it. And with Newly, I can express myself in so many different and fun ways and experiment with new ways and choose clothes styles and try new things so easily. Newly is a subscription clothing rental service. And for $88 a month, I can choose six styles to rent for whatever I have going on. So if I have an event, I can get a dress for that. Or if I just want to try out new stuff, which is what I've been doing and I've been loving it. It gives me access to thousands of styles from more than 300 brands like Free People, Selkie, Love Shack Fancy, Anthropology, in a range of sizes from petite to 5X plus and also maternity. I'm definitely someone who is guilty, I've said this before, of not wanting to be an outfit repeater. I know it's something I need to work on, but I don't really have to if I have newly because this is way more sustainable than buying stuff I'll only wear once. And it's also, like I said, such a great way to try Things you've been wanting to try, whether it's a different trend or a different brand that you're curious about before fully committing to buying, you know? And the best part is that it's flexible. There are no late fees, damage fees, and the option to pause or cancel anytime is there, which is really helpful for someone like me because I'm indecisive and I am literally the worst at returning things. But Newly just makes everything so easy. And I absolutely love it. And I think you will love it too. So if you're like me and you want more style, flexibility, and sustainability in your life, you need Newly. Get $20 off your first month when you sign up with the code CIRCLETIME20. Just go to N-U-U-L-Y dot com. That's Newly with two U's and enter the code CIRCLETIME20 at sign up to get $20 off your first month. Newly, more life in your clothes. Can you share with us kind of like I mean just a broad like what are some of the things that you did have to work on what are some of the things that you did learn yeah about yourself and that you work through in the book yeah well the first and most important thing is finding a sense of safety yeah you know so my whole life I've gone on trips just solo adventure I'm going to Brazil I'm going to Rome for a few weeks yeah and all my friends say things like that's so brave you're just going alone aren't you gonna like be lonely or you know Brazil like you're gonna be in the rainforest how are you gonna do that and I've always just been like well of course I'm gonna do this this isn't brave this is just duh like yeah. I'm live why wouldn't I <laughs> right and I didn't really recognize that I just had no regard for my safety Okay. Because the house I grew up in yeah. was actually dangerous. Yeah. You know, it didn't have a steady foundation, so it always was needing to be fixed. The yeah. The walls were all torn open mm -hmm. because of a botched renovation. Okay. So, like, if you went by it in the hallway, like, you could get a splinter. Like, yeah. it wasn't, it was no place to grow up. Yeah. And so, since I never felt safe, and, and since my parents, they would actively tell me how in danger I was, you know, I go to dinner at the Third Street Promenade with my mom and I'm like 10. The Third Street Promenade is in L.A. Yeah. And it's probably the safest place in the history of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> like of all recorded life on Earth, this is like the Urban Outfitters yeah. and a yeah, bunch yeah, of yeah. rich people's houses. Right, right. And she would say, you know, be careful when you go to the bathroom because you could get raped, murdered, or kidnapped. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was a constant. I was being told how much danger I was in okay. constantly. yeah. So I didn't know safety was a thing okay, at all. Yeah. And it, it wasn't until I was camping alone in Zion and I overheard a dad talking to his kids. Mm -hmm. And the dad said to his kids, 
okay, tomorrow we're going canyoneering. I don't know much about it, but I've hired an expert. So whenever you don't feel safe, just know there's, there's, we have a guide. We have somebody who knows what he's doing. Yeah. So even if you don't feel safe, I'm there to protect you. He's there to protect you. Yeah. And it was like, my mind was friggin' yeah. blown. Yeah. Like, what? Parents tell their kids that they're safe yeah. <laughs> and make any of the precautions for right. them to be safe. I mean, right. I was shocked. And it was at that exact moment where I realized I'm really being held back because I never feel safe. Yeah. And it's really hard to have dreams or go after anything that you want or just to feel baseline content if you don't have a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. And so my very first step on this, you know, finding my soul was just finding any sense of safety, which I did through journaling. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent of journaling. Right. It is a low cost form of therapy yeah. with, with a person who knows you best, you know, you, right, right. where you can really be honest about your emotions, be honest about your feelings. The The words on the page will not come back and bite you yeah. or judge you. I think it's no accident that many people when in dire circumstances keep a journal, yeah. you know, because it's a safe, it's literally a safe space. Right. It's yours. Yeah. And you get to know yourself yes. so well. And yes. like when you, I feel like when you recognize that you have like a voice and these experiences and these thoughts and like you're seeing it kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Like tangible. Yes. Then it, then you kind of see yourself as like a human being and not yes. just like a thing that keeps you alive. Totally. Like, not just like a place to, that your organs are. Yeah. Totally. And I, 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 what would like you, how would you get into journaling? How would you recommend to get into journaling? So my practice, I completely stole from this book that I'm obsessed with. It's Julia Cameron's The Artist Way. Okay. Which if there's anybody who wants to be creative, but they feel like I can't be, it's too late. I'm so limited. I'm not good enough. Get this book. Okay. It will help you. It changed my life. It okay. made me believe I could be an artist. Yeah. And the practice that she has is called The Morning Pages, where you write first thing in the morning before you've like doom scrolled the internet. Okay. You uh, just word vomit three pages of everything you feel inside. Okay. Like, so I've been doing that for like 10 years, I want to say. Wow. I have so many notebooks. I have yeah. so many journals <laughs> at this point. And now I'm like, what do I do with all do these? Do you ever read back? I do. And it's actually interesting because you become a time traveler. Yeah. Like you can yeah. go back, you can see exactly, you know, the... Lily's that book starts on my 25th birthday. Yeah. Woke up the next morning, got all these voicemails from my therapist. And I was like, wait, what? Why is my therapist leaving me messages on a Saturday night? Okay. And it turned out I had drunk dialed her and threatened to kill myself. Wow. And it was like that, it was like such a serious moment because I didn't I didn't know to be scared yeah. for my life yeah. until I heard it in my therapist's voice. Right. And so now, you know, all these years later, two books later, having done so much healing yeah. to look back at that journal yeah. and see where I was, it's incredible. Like I can now like see how much work I did, totally, but also have compassion for anybody who's in that situation. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. So journaling allows you to become a time traveler. Right. I My practice is super basic, but I'd also say... As long as you're journaling three, like three times a week, 15 minutes. Yeah. It, this has also been studied. Like I'm definitely not the first person to say like a journal is helpful. Yeah. But you know, I get yeah. the first person in circle time to say, cause I've never said it because I'm, I actually don't really. And I just kind of have started getting into it, but I feel like I am not that into it and I would love yeah. to get more into it. Yeah. So I recommend every day if you're just starting because yeah. You're just going to throw yourself into the habit. Right. And if you can, you know, I schedule it. It happens the exact same time every morning, 7 a.m. For like 10 years. It's yeah. really hard to, even if I miss one day, that habit is so solidly a part of my life yeah. that I can always return to it. Right. And one thing I've added to this practice that's in my book, uh, this current book, Glow, mm -hmm. is I've added an emotion wheel. Okay. Oh, yeah, I saw. Which mm -hmm. is basically... So if you're like me, yeah. your emotional vocabulary has turned into, how are you doing? Good, bad, sad, busy, tired. Right. Right? Like five words to ex like express the miracle of human life. Right. You know? <laughs> like yeah. everything's reduced to that. Right. And it wasn't until my therapist pointed out, 
you have other emotions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I write this in the book, but I thought I was super anxious. I thought yeah. I was, I'm just an anxious person. I've been born anxious. Okay. So I went to see a psychiatrist to dive in, see if I needed to be medicated for anxiety. And, you know, I was explaining to her, I don't understand why I'm so anxious. I've worked out so many of the issues of my childhood. She's like, well, tell me more about your current life. And I'm like, well, I have this boyfriend and he kind of low key lies to me all of the time. And I never know what's true and what's not true. And I'm kind of like, what is reality? And she, she, she's listening to me. And she's like, I don't think you're anxious. I think you're furious. Yeah. And I was wow. like, yeah. whoa, yeah. you are right. Right. But because I'm not good at being angry, I've pushed that down. Yep. And totally. that feels like anxiety. Yes. Denying how I actually feel is what feels like anxiety. Yeah. So now I've provided people with an emotion wheel. Right. Where you can kind of become surgical about like how you actually do feel. Yeah. You know, if you realize I'm not anxious, I'm furious. You can do something about that. Totally. You can break up with that person. You can have a conversation with that person. Right. But if you're just a wash of anxiety, like what power do you have? Yeah. What are you going to, ha- you know, how are you going to deal with that? So right. I'm hoping to show people that you can become like a surgeon of your own emotions. Like yeah. you can decipher your own emotions. And yeah. once you do, the simple act of labeling how you feel, huge benefits. Right. Like huge, huge, huge. Right. And then you can do something about them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just so incredibly helpful. And I feel yeah. like so many people are going to be able to benefit from that. I hope so. And for I sure. tried to make it like this whole book is not, I talk a lot about therapy, but it's never like the big concept. Right. It's practical applications yeah. that I hope are somewhat entertaining. Like for, They are. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 100%. It's, it's. It's an amazing read. And um, you also talk about meditation. Mm-hmm. And I would love to talk about that a little bit because yes. that's also something that I've yes. recently dipped my toe into. Yes. That I truly never thought that I would. Yeah. And I love like, because you're, because you talk about how you also were like, oh no, not a believer. I, I was a hater. Yeah, same. <laughs> like anytime <laughs> someone way. would say it, I'd be like, cute. Yeah. Okay, like, cool. Thanks. You're better than me. Totally. You know? So I was very angry yeah. <laughs> at meditators. <laughs> I'm like, cool. So you're just sitting on a cushion, not engaged in life at all. Yeah. And you think you're so special <laughs> yeah. because you're like, quote unquote, mind can go blank. Right. Like, good for you. Yeah. I never want to discuss this ever totally. again. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I was completely against meditation. Yeah. But yeah, because I was looking to kind of heal my soul or find a soul, mm-hmm. I annoyingly kept reading in books that all the people I admired the most all meditated. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, God. Yeah. It's probably something to this. Yeah. <laughs> and one of my best friends, who is just like one of the wisest people I know, she was Michelle Obama's former head speech writer. Oh, wow. She just had like, oh, that's amazing. She's like the coolest. Her name yeah. is Sarah. Okay. Um, just what a delightful soul. Yeah. She, in the pandemic, suggested I go on a meditation retreat. Oh. And so I was going from had yes. only meditated for 10 minutes okay. unsuccessfully. Right to meditation retreat, yeah, which was just as terrible as you would think it would be. Yeah. You know, you'd wake up at 5.30 in the morning and meditate till like eight. Yeah. I hated all of the rules. I hated all the instructions. You know, yeah. they'd say stuff like, find your seat, which is like, what does that mean? Yeah. Find your seat. You mean like your butt? Like feel how your butt feels in the right, chair? Right, right. I, I just realized there was like all this language that was kind of obscuring what meditation right, is. Right, right. And what I came to find out is, so many people say, I'm bad at meditating. I'm mm-hmm. a bad meditator. Mm-hmm. That's not possible. Right. It's every time your mind wanders, that's actually the practice is your mind is wandering to your laundry. You mm-hmm. cannot sit there. Your mind is wandered to your laundry. You notice, oh man, lost in laundry and you come back. Right. And you like acknowledge. Yes. You notice. Yes. It's all which, about noticing and coming back. Exactly. That's meditation. Ex- and I, and I'm, learning that as well and it's just it's actually just like been so much more helpful than I ever yeah thought it would be and I feel like I'm kind of like sheepish to admit because yeah. I'm like have you know talked Hated. shit about it yeah. yeah but now I'm like oh it did help and I it was it took like it took me talking to a friend of mine who I think were very similar we had very similar ideas on what it was and she was really angry about a certain situation. And then I talked to her about it like maybe six months later. And she was like, oh, you know, I've actually just kind of like been doing like a seven minute meditation every morning. And 
that's really, I'm not worried about that anymore. And I was like, you? Like, you're yeah. not worried about that? Like, there's things that I don't have to be worried about. If yeah. you don't have to worry about that, then there's definitely shit that I'm making up in my mind totally. that I don't have to worry about. Yeah. And it really, like, helped me during the day, like, come back to what I was thinking about when I was meditating and, like, revisit those thoughts. And yes. It, like, helped so much. Yeah. For me, the thing I'm always clear about is it's not like meditation overnight made me feel joyful or totally. find my purpose. Yeah. Yeah. What it did was give me more space. Yeah. To feel different emotions right. and not be overwhelmed. Like exactly to what you're talking about. Like to like I used to get if I got worried or criticized by someone, that's all I could think about was that right. one thing would overwhelm me. Mm -hmm. Now I have enough space inside that yeah, that can be there. Yeah. And I could be grateful for sitting here with you. Right. I could be excited for a trip I'm going to go on this weekend. Right. I, I'm just never taken over yeah. in the way that I used to be. Totally. And it's really helpful. Yeah. Honestly. It sucks. I know. It's, <laughs> such, it's so embarrassing wish, to admit. <laughs> I wish it were not the case. Me too. But it, but is. it works. It does. <laughs> it really does. And to all of you uh, meditation eye rollers out there, I totally get it. But it actually. It does. It, so it how, that's yeah. who that chapter is written for. Yeah. Is because I am very cynical of Me too. meditation. I'm cynical in general. Yes. Yeah. Like any of these tools I've tried, I started with this won't work for me. Right. <laughs> and like I'm a spiteful, self righteous person. Yeah. So I'm looking for it not to work. Right. Right. Totally. You know, I feel like a lot of times I kind of get in a headspace where I'm like, I already know this about myself and I know who I am and yeah. I just know that that's not going to work for me. Exactly. Or I'm just like very, I, I am a very cynical person a lot of times. Yeah. And, I think like it does come back to bite me in the ass a lot of times because totally. I'm not opening myself up to things that I know or not that I know, but things that could help. You know, I've had to become a lot more like playful about this kind of thing and just be like, whatever, it works, it doesn't work. I tried it. Yeah. It's, pro it's probably gonna be silly and kind of funny no matter what happens. Yeah, yeah. Just to like get myself out of that cynicism. Yeah. Because the truth is, I don't always know myself. Totally. And I don't know what I'm going to yeah. like and don't like right. until I actually try. Right. It's You really do have to try yeah. anything before you can just like completely. Write it off. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is hard when you're cynical. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. And stubborn. You just have to I jump am. in. Yeah, yeah. And so I hope that the book helps. Like, yeah. Especially with meditation, I try to break down the language. Yeah. You know, if you've meditated, you know they try to say, find your anchor. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. And, and usually, and you're like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Yeah. And they usually say your breath is your anchor, like the thing you can return to and steady yourself on. Right. Except I don't know how to breathe right. Right. Like I've done no breath work. I have zero idea how to breathe. Yeah. That I should look into next. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things I write in the book is, well, that, this BS, you have so many other anchors you could use. Just right. grounding yourself to the chair. My butt is my anchor. Right. When I'm sitting down to meditate, I'm just like, ooh, I feel my butt on a chair. Yes. Anchor. Right. You know, so totally. I just feel like they use a lot of fancy language, but it's actually not really that fancy. Right. And also like, it's like finding what works for you yes. within that thing. Yeah. Like is what with everything, I feel like, is just what makes things, what makes it helpful. Like, you don't have, there's no, like, rule book for exactly no. how, what you should be doing. Totally. But instead, find what works for you, and it, you're instantly going to, like, succeed at yes. whatever it is that you're trying to do yes. when you when you're doing what's working for you. And I always, I always used to thought there were adults who had the answers, and, like, I just need to find one of these adults. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns out everybody's lying. Exactly. Nobody knows what they're I, doing. That's, like, the beauty of getting <laughs> yeah. older is, yeah. like, realizing that, like, uh, you know, like you're the age that yeah. you think that you're going to have everything figured out. And then you're talking, I'm talking to my mom now and she's like, oh, I have no idea. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. You should have told me that yeah. because then I would have probably yeah. like, you know. Basically, none of us know what's going on. None of us know what's going on. We're all like trying to function. Yeah. I'm lying to myself all day long, <laughs> you know, like much less what I'm saying to the outside world. Right. And it's kind of about being like, oh, right. So nobody knows what they're doing. Right. Everybody's lost. Yeah. Let me find what works for me. Exactly. In this. Yeah. Exactly. It's so true. It's it's so interesting. And I feel like also there's a lot of listeners who are we get because I do like these I do voicemails. And so people yeah. call in, they leave voicemails and we can give them advice. We could do a couple. I think it would be fun. Awesome. But, um, you know, they're in high school and college. And there's so many times when you think that you are like 
you're too old to be doing yeah something or like you're like I'm like you were saying like you're what in your mid 20s and you oh, think yeah. that you should have everything figured out and you think that everyone else around you has it figured out and no one does no one and you're so young then you're yeah. young always like you just are like there's always time to grow and to yeah. do to try yeah you know until you're dead right like then yeah you're <laughs> <laughs> you're then, too late maybe then. you're too late but but I was convinced I was 25 like the show, I don't know if you ever saw an HBO Girls, Lena yeah, Dunham show. Yeah, of course. So yeah. that show had just come out and I was okay. like, damn, I- I'm never going to be her. Like she got the only slot on HBO right. for all of time right. where young women <laughs> yeah. could write. Like I'm so screwed. Yeah. And it's funny, like now to look back at how down on myself I was at yeah. such a young age and to see, oh, 25 actually is the very beginning Totally. It's like you've barely started. Yeah. <laughs> like, you have so much time. So, yeah. And even now, like in your mid 30s, there's so, much, so time. much time. Yeah. And then I meet readers who are like 50 and they're divorced and they're starting over again. There's so, so much, much time. time. Yeah. Exactly. You know, at every phase of your life, there's more time if you embrace it. Yeah. If you waste it, thinking yeah. about how little time you have. Yeah. Then, yeah, you're. <laughs> then you're not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's better to just start whatever totally. it is you want to do. Yeah. And I, it's just funny. Like I, every 25 year old now that I talk to and they ask for advice, I usually the first thing I say is like, don't worry. Yeah. Whatever you're worried about yeah. doesn't even matter. Totally. Like, like I am the ghost of Christmas past like it's here to so tell true you, though like, like you're fine yeah or even like in high school like the shit yeah. that I used to think mattered yes. every, at every stage you think something is so matters so much more oh. than it actually does even like three weeks ago yeah. something that yeah. like completely occupied my brain I'm like oh that shit didn't even matter yeah a little bit right I haven't thought about it yeah one time no it was no, all no. I could think about and now it's like doesn't matter yeah. and I, I think that's actually meditation and journaling Practices like that where you're constantly in touch with your feelings and emotions yeah. and can better see what stories you're telling yourself. Yeah. You get quicker and quicker of unhooking from those stories and realizing like, oh, this does not matter. Right. Right. And seeing kind of also like reading about your past experiences yes. and seeing how intensely you were feeling about those things. And you're like, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> like, why was I like that? 10 like, out of 10 stress. Y- yes, exactly. Yeah. And then... You think like, see, it wasn't even a big deal. You thought it was the end of the world and you forgot about it. You're laughing about it now. Literally nothing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> In this book, what was like, were there parts that kind of wrote themselves and like parts that were kind of harder to get to the bottom of and figure yeah. out? What was like the hardest, if you don't mind sharing, no. what was like the hardest part to write and what like kind of wrote itself? Yeah. Okay. Two answers. Okay. One is not one thing wrote itself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's literally nothing in this book. I'm just not that kind of writer. I've yeah. never been like struck by inspiration. Okay. I'm not in a cabin in the woods, like having, you know, an ethereal moment with God right. and the universe is downloading. The, <laughs> I, like the only time anything wrote itself for me was one line in my last book. Okay. Which is life is not a series of crises to be endured. It's to be enjoyed. Okay. It's like I love that. One of my life maxims. Yeah. I have to bring myself back to that always. Yeah. That's the only phrase that ever just like popped into my head. Mm-hmm. Everything else is a struggle. To like, <laughs> yeah. like to sit there and remember and then write down. And then I'm like, you know, insane editor of my own stuff. Every essay's been gone over like yeah. seven times by the time it goes into a book. So everything is hard for me. Okay. Uh, it does not come naturally to me. But the hardest of all, oh, and the only reason I mention that is because if anyone's listening and they wants to be a writer, yeah. if a writer tells you that it was so easy, yeah. they're either lying or they're mm. not a writer. Okay. I don't know a single writer friend who would ever say that like inspiration is just striking me all the time. Yeah. It's like you put it on your schedule mm-hmm. and it's a habit like anything else. It's work right. like anything else. Right. You just have to do it. Right. That's the real trick about writing is you have to write. You yeah. can't talk about writing. You have to do it. Yeah. But I think that's good news because we can all do work and totally. writing just work. Yeah. So that's why I mentioned that. Okay. But there is a chapter in the book that deals with suicidal ideation, which okay. is something I've dealt with my whole life. Mm-hmm. And that chapter was hard. Yeah. That I'm one sure. was extremely hard to write. Yeah. It's the thing that I was the most shy to write about. Yeah. Because who wants 
to be known as the girl constantly dealing with suicidal ideation. Yeah. Except I knew there were other people like me. Right. And the, this essay is for people who've been through that. It's got some really practical tips on how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Or for people who love people who people, deal with th- yeah. like th- things like that. Because right. we use such distancing language like, I can't imagine doing that to yourself. Right. Or that's so selfish. Yes. But if you say that out into the air, you don't know who's around you. Totally. What if your best friend is actually dealing with that? Yeah. And you have just said, that's selfish. I can't imagine. Why would that friend ever come to you? Right. If they needed help. Right. What, like, right. you have just said it's this terrible thing. Yeah. And so I'm really hoping to open up more of a conversation about how, you know, there are certain circumstances in life that, would make you want to feel that way. People have been through some really bad stuff. Yeah. Disease, abandonment, all these different issues. Yeah. And if we could just be more open and listen, Mm -hmm. we might be able to save more lives. So that essay was really hard to write. It's called The Hot Rabbi because I was dating a very hot rabbi at the time. Okay. And so it begins... Like, it's going to be this rom com yeah. romance, like Jenna Elfman, Ben Stiller, Keeping the Faith, right. early 2000s yeah. situation, yes. but it's not. Okay. It's a whole other essay. Okay. But I, I really hope people read that one of yeah. everything. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, I think it's so important to have that conversation be more open and yeah. feel like a safe like allow people to feel like it's a safe space to talk about yeah. stuff like that and that you are there for them and totally whatnot. that's yeah. the number one thing i want people to feel is yeah. what's not normal is to not talk about any of this right that's what's weird is to bottle all of these things up and yeah. not help one another what is like healthy and beautiful is to say yeah these things exist right and we're going to talk about them so that we don't lose loved ones yeah you exactly. Know, with the story of a hot rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> little icing on Just top. Just a little, yeah, a little yeah, romance yeah. in there. <laughs> a little romance, a little hot rabbi. Yeah, exactly. To top off exactly. the situation. Exactly. Okay. I mean, I just think it's everything that you're writing is just so amazing. If there are people who are listening who haven't read either book, mm-hmm. do you recommend that they read Lily's first or is it, are Not they kind necessarily. of separate? They're, they're, they definitely both stand on their own. Okay. Lily's, if you want, like, here's a game plan, just hear a bunch of rituals delivered in a somewhat funny, you know, I'm biased, but. I'm sure they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> funny yeah. way. Then Lily's is definitely the book. Okay. If you're like, I really want to get in touch with my soul. I don't trust myself anymore. I would like to trust myself more. I'd like to make decisions yeah. in an easier, less tortured fashion. Yeah. Then Glow is the book for you. Okay. But they both, you know, they you could pick either one up. You don't need to know. You don't need anything. to know one. Okay. No, it's not like a serialized Netflix thing where you're gonna Got be it. like, wait, what? Yeah. No, <laughs> they're like completely <laughs> separate. Rabbi? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, do I need to know about yeah. this? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't need to know anything for either of the books. Okay. Yeah. I just want them to know. Yeah. How so it took you what, five years to write Lilies? Took me all kinds of years. Okay. It took me just it either took me three years total mm-hmm. or three. 30 years total. Okay. Which makes sense. You know, yeah. it's like, uh, and I wrote it also just for anyone who like wants to be creative, but they think something like, but I got bills to pay and a job to do. Yeah. I had a full time job, a very stressful full time job for the entirety of writing Lilies. Right. I just woke up early every morning and wrote. I missed some girls' trips. Yeah. To like, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. That was fine. <laughs> I also wrote a book. Right. You know, so right. it's possible. Again, you just have to like actually block off the time. And my number one tip there is just use your iPhone or whatever, your cell phone timer. Mm-hmm. Time yourself for one hour. Mm-hmm. Like, start at 20 minutes, time, whatever, whatever amount of time you can actually do. Yeah. But don't do anything else during that time. There's okay. no going on Instagram. There's no online shopping. Yeah. There's nothing else but writing. Yeah. And if you can't write, just sit there. Like, yeah. You're in prison okay. until you, wow. <laughs> until that timer goes off. That's, yeah. I mean, that's how I wrote my first book. Right. Would you be willing to do a couple yeah, voicemails? I think it's really fun. And I feel like you could offer some guidance, perhaps, Love it. or some Absolutely. wisdom. On if the I have any. Every time I think I'm not going to have any, I always end up end up pulling out a little bit. So I think, like a jam. I think we could do it. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, Kelsey. My name's Jack. I'm not sure if you've ever had a guy call in before, but I'm a guy circler. Gurkler, if you will. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of us who listen to you, especially me, 
love to listen because we relate to you a lot. And a lot of the things you say really speak to us. And you've given a lot of advice to other people, but I think it would be really nice and really helpful if you could share any advice that you would want to give to your younger self. Because I think that there's a good chance that it would speak and resonate to a lot of us. So thank you so much. I love the pod and I hope you're having a great day. Oh my God, how sweet. A gurgler. I love that. That is so sweet, Jack. Thank you for calling. I think we've talked a lot about younger selves yeah. already. If you could pick out one, just one, yeah, which I think is tough, but like, what would what would you say to your younger self? Probably what we were talking about before. If I could, I don't know if I could have heard this though. Don't worry. Yeah. Like, I don't know if it's possible to say to someone like, hey, you're good and yeah. you don't need to worry as mm-hmm. much as you're worrying. Mm-hmm. I would, it would be that or please smoke less weed. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to amend mine because we already talked about not worrying. Mine is please put the bong down. Really? Oh, yeah. You liked the bong? So, hardcore. Really? Yeah, because because I was trying to dissociate yeah. from my emotion and yeah. moods and like hide my childhood right. behind smoke. But okay. What happened then was I really didn't know myself because I was hiding myself from my moods. Right. I, I mean, I just didn't know who I was right. because I was just smoking weed Right. All the so, time. I mean, that's... a there's the bigger lesson there. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I would say probably I'd like I would say the same thing. Also, it's hard to tell someone not to worry because I feel like anytime I'm worrying about someone, if someone says to me like, oh my God, don't, don't worry. worry so much about that. I'm like, okay, fuck off. I'm like, like I'm worried. I'm up. literally worried. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you want me to do. Yeah. But it's true in the sense of like, whatever seems like the most, the, the hardest thing right now when you're younger always you you can get through it and you will get through it and like it's never as like never as bad as you think it's going to be and it does get better over time it really does yeah and you know it's like it's not like you get older and then everything's like easy peasy but I do feel like you just see that things aren't as like deep as you think they are a lot of the time and that you have a whole bigger life than any one issue Right. You know, when, when you're young, you actually haven't lived that many years. I mean, but we're both very young. So yeah. I feel also like, yeah. I'm not like seven, you know what I right. but like, right. But you haven't lived that much life. So totally. everything actually is a bigger deal yeah. than it really is. So yeah. just remembering like perspective if you right. could. Right. And I didn't smoke a lot of weed when I was a kid. But I would say maybe don't drink like bright blue vodka or like eat food when, before you drink if you're going to drink. Yeah, please eat. Please eat. God. And that, so that's that's my advice on the substance portion. I wish I had met you to be like, please eat. <laughs> like, don't do this. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're thinking right now. Well, I, I didn't know that either. Yeah, but exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Thanks, Jack, for calling. I love a gurkler. Can we do one more, Marsh? Hi, Kelsey. My name's Hallie, and I was just wondering, because I'm a huge fan of both you and Cody, and I was just wondering if there was ever any, like, since you guys are both in the same field, you know, you both have podcasts, you both have YouTube channels, and you're both, you know, online creators. Is there ever a sense of, like, not competition, but maybe just, like, you know, is there ever any comparison there? I know y'all's content's pretty different, but, you know, how do you navigate being in the same field as your partner without comparing yourself to each other, if that makes sense? Um, Huge fan of you guys. Uh, Choo choo. And also love circle time. Bye. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I think that, I know this is kind of like specific, but I do think that talking about like competition and comparing yourself to just like peers and friends and people is like a bigger thing. I like personally to that question, I think, you know, I do. It's very hard not to compare yourself to like someone that you are so close with that you're doing the same thing as, but you know, Cody and I have a healthy relationship and in very like, communicative relationship and so that never really like gets in the way of 
we're not like ever competing against each other. We're always like lifting each other up. But I think that that takes a long time to learn. So like for you, did you ever have relationships, whether romantic or friendships or in the same workspace? And like, do you even now, like, do you have other friends that are authors and you feel like a weird comparison to numbers and yeah. sales and all of that? So I have a lot of friends who are authors. Yeah. Or they're sort of in in my, um, my like, now they're my colleagues. Like, yeah. I actually was with an author podcaster this morning who is so much more successful than me, like 55,000 times more successful f- for, than me, who's so smart, just enviable career. Yeah. And the only thing I want to do is help her. And the only thing she wants to do right, is help me. Right. I honestly think that the the more you get to know yourself, it's just I'm like, I'm not who am I competing with? Like totally. I'm so in my own lane. Yeah. Like there's no one here to even yeah. compare myself to. Plus, I want to be uplifted, so I uplift. Right. It's something I really think about when I meet other authors is how can I be of service to them? Lord knows they're gonna be service to of me right. at some point. Right. And the only thing you kind of have to be careful about is who you spend your time with. Totally. Because if you're spending your time with the wrong people, yeah. yes, of course, competition's going to come up. Yeah. And they're also not the people to trust with information. Right. You know, like I, right. I once told a fellow author, I'm usually really good about being transparent with money. Yeah. Like this was my advance. This is how much I made here because women don't talk about right. money enough. Totally. So if agree I agree with that, yeah. Be a part of the change, great. Yeah. But- if you tell it to someone who is competitive mm-hmm. and isn't your vibe of like, let's help each other, they can hold that against you forever. Yeah. So it's always, for me, it's about first, am I in the right company? Yes. And if so, and am I here for the right reasons? Yeah. If so, then all I want to do is share and uplift. Yeah. Because we need that. I totally agree. I'm I'm like a very... I'm like the least competitive person yeah. ever. I, I've never enjoyed competing. But I also think that like when you're around the right people, there's no need for it. Exactly. And so like I don't think in numbers Yeah. ever. Like I'm not like sitting with someone thinking like, well, she has this many <laughs> subscribers. Like she could really help me or like I don't need to talk to her. She only has this many subscribers yeah. like this because – that's just a number. Like, yeah. it's about forming those relationships. And ma- and when you find, like, strong connections like that, like, comparison and competitiveness, like, that's not what's important. It's about helping each other yeah. and lifting each other up. And like you said, like, of course, making sure that you're giving that energy to someone who deserves it and isn't yeah. going to take advantage of it yeah, and absolutely. whatnot. But that's easier to find than you think. Oh, totally. And like so many people are looking for that. And the more the people who know themselves the best and are the most confident in themselves. Yeah. I've also seen tend to be the most successful and the most willing to share. For sure. Because they're just over that. Yeah. Like there's no like they're not trying to this woman is not trying to compete with me. Totally. Like, yeah. She's already doing her own <laughs> thing, you know. Right. Um, And so if anything, exactly what you said, though, is also not any of I'll admit something very unflattering. I have befriended people before where I'm like, well, they have this much following and maybe I'll get on their feed and that will mean this. Yeah. Every time I've done it for that reason, yeah. it has blown up in my face right. in some kind of way. Right, but how would you know? You had to learn I learned the one lesson way. the hard way yeah. that I'll never do that again yeah. because it's, those aren't the, that's not the energy I want to be attracting. That's not the energy I right. want thrown my way. Right, you know? totally. So I totally, yeah, I agree. It's like, connections is this real and then they're really the only competition i really feel is if we were to play code names oh my and god then, i was just playing that the other <laughs> night that game fucking yeah. ruins it lives. ruins lives <laughs> they call it the divorce maker <laughs> rightfully so <laughs> that that game is fucking scary. very competitive i've like i've had to stop playing i like i just said i'm not a competitive person but even that game i'm like well, yeah everyone else is screaming at each other screaming. and i'm like we've got to stop no i screamed the last yeah. time i played it I That's, was screaming yeah. and like clapping and ruining a party. Yeah, no, it's pretty bad because then you're like, what was that? You just nodded. Why yeah, are you, why yeah, are you why nodding? Are you yeah, no, it's pretty. <laughs> That's so true. That is the most intense fucking game yes, ever. Yes. Ever. So that's the that's an acceptable that's, either don't yeah. play it or do and it's an acceptable competitiveness. Yes. But yeah. in everything else, stay in your own right. lane. <laughs> just Other than that, ahead. yeah. <laughs> really good advice. Oh God, code names. Just got a little PTSD from that one. <laughs> okay. Well, the final thing 
We do a little journal time. Oh. Which you're, you're a, you know, journaler. Yes. But so when I was teaching preschool, I would have the kids like write in their journals and you ask them like pretty simple questions and it's just to kind of get their brains working. And so I take like questions for little kids basically and we answer them and see if we can get a little deeper or not. Sometimes Beautiful. they're just fun. But if you want to pick one and we can answer it. You're so crafty. Oh my God. You know, this, this, these are pretty. These are like, what do you call this again? A pipe cleaner. This is a beautiful pipe cleaner that is both copper and I want to say like aquamarine. That's a pretty one. This is gorgeous. Yes. You know, I I take pride in my pipe cleaners. This is beautiful. Okay. So I'm unrolling the pipe cleaner. Yes. The way that I roll them up, I've really got to work on that because it's like not (sighs) really. Okay. Thank you. That's impressive. Thank you. It's like a little flag. Okay. Oh, top 10 list of people you admire slash look up to. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a very good one. Okay, so, and I ans- I say what you, would be yes. true for me. Yes. Okay, Cheryl Strayed, the okay. writer mm-hmm. who wrote Tiny Beautiful Things. Amazing. If, if you need inspo, definitely a good book. Okay. Nora Ephron, dead, uh, director of You've Got Mail, <laughs> was in Seattle. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's how I'm going to start introducing people. Nora yeah. Ephron, dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. Um, Clarify if all of these are yeah. dead or alive. Fiance, very alive. Thriving. Th- thriving. Yeah. <laughs> Sh- showing the rest of us up, but again, she is not competitive. She's right. Like, she doesn't care. give a fuck yeah, about she's anyone. Like, cool. Yeah. Who else would I say? I would say my friend, Dr. Jennifer Freed, is just like one of those people you meet and you're like, oh, your soul is pure. Great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has a book out right now called Map Your Soul, which I highly recommend. Okay. She's good. You know when you meet somebody and you're like, oh, you're good. Oh, yeah. It's the best. That's her vibe. Yeah. Five. Okay. Now I need one more for five. Who do you, do you have some, some names? Oh, boy. I would probably say, oh, my God, I wasn't expecting you to toss this over to me <laughs> so fast. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like rummaging the old brain. I'm trying to think of... People whose like work I admire. Yeah. Ryan oh my God. <laughs> Ryan Seacrest. I do really love Ryan Seacrest. I was watching his videos right before I got here, actually. Um, yes, I do. I'm a big fan of Ryan Seacrest okay. because I think that he just does so many things. He truly, he does. truly does so many things. What I what I actually admire about Ryan Seacrest, now that I'm on my Ryan Seacrest rampage, is that he still works on the radio show. Mm. And I just feel like he does that because he loves it. And to yeah. see someone who has gotten so much success. Yeah. But like, he always wanted to be a DJ. He always wanted to be a radio DJ. And I used to listen to him growing up, going to school. So mm. like, I've been on this train for a while. Mm-hmm. And like, he can just do, he hasn't like forgotten where he's like, where he comes from. And I yeah. think that that's really admirable for people totally. who like, have so much success in so many different areas and to just to like, stay true to who they are. Yeah. I think is just respectable. That's beautiful. Thank you. I didn't mean to like talk about a very deep, Ryan Seacrest, but, but I know here what we you are. Mean. But it's true. It just yeah. it's nice that he's like not just like thrown that to the to the trash. Yeah, just because he doesn't need it anymore. Totally. You know, he's like uh, true to his roots. Yes, and, and also hands think, his has his hands dirty in the actual like working. That's a hard right, job. Right. And like yeah. it's like the one that he probably like doesn't need to do. Yeah. Like people are probably still like, why do you still do the yeah. little radio show? Right, but right, he right. like loves it. Yeah. And I just think it's, I just think that staying true to who you are is very important. Yeah. And I just think Excellent. it's amazing that he does yeah. that. Oh my God. There I go again. <laughs> Talking about Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you come up with anyone as I was okay, like, yes. yapping away? I've got Elise Lunen, who she worked at Goop. Did have you ever, have you ever saw the Goop TV series? I, I did not. So she's the other woman at besides Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. She's one of the smartest people I know. She's okay. worked at every magazine. She's edited everything. Okay. And talk about somebody who helps other women. She is the least competitive, most... I'll get a text from her being like, you should be on Substack. You should meet so-and-so at this place. I didn't yeah. ask. Yeah, totally. She has just gone out of her way That's to so be amazing. such a wonderful connector, resource, yeah. guiding light, and is just like one of the smartest people I know. Yeah. I would choose her. Okay. I would choose, I'm trying to think of like, I mean, everybody's going to choose Dolly Parton. Who's not? So true. Who uh, who in America? This is so not, true. She's our national hero. She's she, what unites us. She is our national hero. Do you want to hear something so embarrassing? Please. We went to <laughs> we went to a like country night the mm-hmm. other night, and my husband had a few 
cocktails <laughs> and there was a Dolly Parton impersonator. Oh man. And someone was like, oh, come meet Dolly Parton backstage. And he thought that it was like the real Dolly Parton. And he was like, <laughs> I am like, I bow down to you. I love you. Like, thank you for everything you've done. <laughs> and then he showed me a picture and I was like, that is not Dolly Parton. <laughs> that was an impersonator. That's amazing. Well, but he would agree probably that she's one of the people that we need to admire. So she does unite us all. And also, and so, so does her impersonator. The, the impersonator <laughs> yeah. should get some shine for she choosing should, and, Dolly Parton. And for being so good at it, yeah, apparently. That one could just think, ah, yes, this makes sense. That Dolly Parton would be yeah. backstage here. <laughs> at this With little bar in yeah. Venice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's excellent. Dolly Parton's a really good one. Are you a Taylor Swift fan? Am I human? Okay, thank God. Well, I would say Taylor <laughs> Swift. Let's both say huge on Taylor Swift. Yeah. I like try to emulate her in the author space because okay. she has inspired so much loyalty in me mm-hmm. that I, I answer every email it's that I get so through true. the newsletter. Yeah. Not every DM, but I try to get to most. And like utmost respect for the reader. Yeah. Because they're the one who gives you your whole career. It's true. Yeah. So I've, I admire her. I try to be like her. Yeah. What a genius. So prolific. I mean, such a genius. She's the best. She really is the best. I mean, that is also my heart's one. racing. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm kind of sweaty. So no, she's literally the best. I talk yeah. about her all the time yeah. on here. She is. Yes, yeah, she's excellent. I mean, are you going to her shows? Any of them? No, I was unable to secure tickets, but I do have two sets of tickets for Beyonce. Oh. I need to sell one. <laughs> so if you're listening, <laughs> maybe I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got them like the moment they came on sale. When is she going on tour? I think in September. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. So I want. Let's I talk offline. Get <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, Taylor Swift is is like probably number one for me. She's in Powerhouse. Yeah, she's incredible. It almost doesn't. Is if you don't know at this point, I just like it's really hard when someone tries to like. Disagree. Who would disagree at this point there's, in history? There's still some. There's mm. still some like tricklers. Oh, I disagree with them. Me too. But you know what? They'll learn. And I'm kind of jealous because they still get to learn. You know? That's a beautiful interpretation. Thank yeah. You. It's true. Like, they're about they're to. one day they're going to like hear her s- something. Yeah. And it's, it's going to change. Yeah. Whatever it is, whatever album. It's like a movie where you're jealous that the person, they're about to experience what you loved. Oh my God. Or see the ending that you totally. loved. Totally. Yes. Yeah. You feel like joy for them and jealousy. Yes. I love watching movies with people who have never, who, that I've seen and they've never seen the movie. Like oh, Crazy uh-huh. Stupid Love. Uh huh. I Great love movie. watching people watch when like that like switch happens and like mm. the little, um, I'm like forgetting every word today, when this little surprise happens mm-hmm. in the middle there or mm-hmm. at the end. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just love watching it with people. The shot, their just their faces. Yes, because I'm like, yeah, and I'm just joy. watching them the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good one. That yeah, a good one. I'm trying to think of if there's anybody else right now who's like on my top, top. Glennon Doyle, I admire a lot. Yes, excellent author. That's a great one. Also, just bared her soul and is so true to herself. Yeah. Always, yes, embodies the word authentic. Yes, she won't fake anything, which is just so amazing. Like, never nice for nice sake. You know what I mean? Totally. Like, if she doesn't want to do something, she's not going to do it. Yeah. That's you know? the best. Like she's cool. Yeah. I feel like I've gotten to 10 I feel like you've gotten to 10. At least eight. Which is a lot. That's a lot. This is a good prompt, though. I'm going to steal this from my own journaling practice. This you is should. Great. It's all yours. Thank you. Yeah. Can I keep the... You can also the keep the pipe, pipe cleaner. cleaner. <laughs> Thank you. You're the first person who's ever asked. Well, I also fashioned a ring out of it while we were. Oh just my sitting god! Here. Isn't that Thank pretty? you for appreciating my pipe cleaners. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well. That's the end of Circle Time. Tara, thank you so much for joining us. This was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And everybody, get out there and read the book. Glow in the fucking dark. Glow in the fucking dark. Or buy yourself the fucking rays. But Glow is the newest. Glow in the fucking dark. Both of them. Read them both. Because obviously (laughs) they're really good and she's amazing. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you for watching.
Please note that this episode may contain paid endorsements and advertisements for products and services. Individuals on the show may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to in this episode.